living room, and I heard someone laughing upstairs. I knew there was no one up there, and I didn't see anyone, but I could feel like there was someone there. The laugh itself didn't sound like a happy, funny, that was a great joke kind of laugh. It was more of a sinister, I'm going to get you kind of laugh. Lori wasn't the only one who was sensitive to the atmosphere in the house. Her cousins noticed it too. When it was not nice outside, we would be sent into the basement to play. The heater was in the far back corner, and as long as I can remember, we would joke with each other that that's where the ghost was buried. Because next to the heater, there was a depression in the floor. Um, it was a very old kind of linoleum floor over dirt and that part of the floor kind of sunk down lower as the house settled and it was the size and shape of a grave it was very creepy up until now Lori had just been a visitor at her grandparents house but that was all about to change my parents divorced and we moved to my grandparents house I was already not happy because my parents divorced, but the thought of having to live in that house was like my worst nightmare coming true. So I felt like I was being sentenced to like some kind of long prison sentence. When we moved there, I noticed that no matter what time of year it was, there were certain areas in the house that were always freezing cold one of them being my bedroom didn't make sense because my room got all the morning sun it was on that side of the house so it should have been bright cheerful and really warm but it wasn't Lori tried to ignore the strange experiences but they continued there was this old rocking chair I would hear a noise and I'd look over and the chair would be moving back and forth and back and forth and then it stopped like dead stop just like someone put their feet down on the floor And then I would look back at the chair and it would be rocking. The air in the room just got that feeling like something was about to happen. I hated that chair. That chair just gave me absolute creeps. And if I got up to go tell my grandmother, it would stop. My grandmother was a very religious person, so we had a lot of pictures throughout the house of religious themes. Now, I specifically requested and wanted a picture of the Blessed Mother in my room. I was hoping that it would lessen the appearances of whatever it was. But that would not happen. The picture literally fell off the wall. The nail was still on the wall, so it didn't fall out of the wall. It was lifted off the nail. The hook was still on the picture, still intact. I would be getting dressed for school in the morning. I'd take my clothes out of the drawers. I'd push the drawer back in. I'd put my clothes on, I'd turn around. All my drawers would be open. 
I pushed them back in. I would go to the bathroom, I'd come back in my room. All the drawers were open again. My personal belongings would always be moved, misplaced. My mother and my grandmother would tell me that it was my imagination and that I needed to stop all this nonsense because I was scaring the younger kids. A spirit can pick and choose most of the time who it wants to communicate with. And sometimes it will find people who are more open to see it. And I've always found out, you know, in, in my um, travels of investigating that children are more susceptible to seeing spirits. And um, chances are that child has seen something that your average person unable to see or at least don't want to see. Things got much more intense in my room specifically. I started to hear scratching in the walls like someone was stuck in a wall and trying to get out. Like intense scratching. And I would feel like there was someone right over my back. Hull had lived in a state of constant fear since moving into her grandparents' house. I started to hear scratching in the walls. I would feel like there was someone right over my back, and you would feel like you could not breathe when that would happen, like it would take all the air out of the room. It was a suffocating kind of feeling. It scared the life out of me. I was sure I was going to die. It eventually kind of receded back towards the bottom of the bed. <laughs> so far, only Lori had experienced weird phenomena, but that would soon change. At one point, um, I was about 16 or 17. I had invited one of my friends to stay over because um, we were out and he had missed the last bus home. So I said he could stay in my room and I'll sleep on the sofa. He came downstairs in the middle of the night and we'll never forget this. <laughs> Woke me up where I was sleeping on the sofa and he said, I'm walking home. I cannot sleep in your room. He said that he woke up and there was something dark, like right over him. And he said he swore it was going to, like, smother him or do something to kill him. When that happened, then I knew. I was like, okay, it's not me. I'm not crazy. This is really actually happening because I never told anybody that. And for someone else to come down and say exactly what happened to me, it... I mean, it was scary, but I was in a way happy because I knew that was the moment I knew I wasn't crazy. My friends and I decided that we would try to find out more about who it was and what it was trying to do. We decided to use a Ouija board to try and contact the spirit in the house. It started to really move more, I guess, purposefully. F R. We had asked for a name, and we seemed to be speaking to a woman who called herself Fran. F. One of my friends got really scared and didn't want to do it anymore, so she left the circle. I wondered if Fran was the woman who I hear, heard laughing on different occasions and the one who was opening the drawers. Fran said,
said that she had lived in the house, she indicated that she had committed suicide. If you were somebody that conjured up spirits or you were into, you know, magic or whatever you were doing, um, and it was of negative um, influence, and then and now you go into somebody else's house and uh, a spirit would see you as um, as a threat. One night I was asleep and something had woke me up. There was a woman just standing there. And then I saw that she had a rope in her hand. And she was just staring at me. She would put the noose around her neck and pulled it. I was moving towards the edge of the bed. And when I got to the edge of the bed and went to put my legs over, she picked her head up. I lifted the rope off of where it was and stepped down. I was so completely overcome with terror, I took off down the stairs. After several horrific experiences, Lori Hull was desperate to escape the terrifying spirits in her home. And I looked at my grandparents' room, which was downstairs, and I started yelling for them to wake up, and she said, they're not going to wake up. I put them to sleep. Lori was so scared she stayed awake all night. My grandparents were awake in the morning. I asked them if they had heard anything last night. They said no. It was still there, but it didn't touch me. It didn't do as many things. And as soon as I was 18, I was out the door <laughs> of that house. So and I moved to my friends were moving to Virginia Beach and I was gone. You know, I'm still trying to recover from what I experienced in that house. I think I will be haunted by those experiences for the rest of my life. more than one witness to a paranormal event, it can prove that the experience is genuine. But when the phenomenon is truly terrifying, multiple witnesses provide little comfort. Story 27, Frank, take one. Marker. This is the first time I've really publicly told the story. I met Marcia, um, actually she was a waitress who worked for me at a restaurant. As the time went on, we, you know, became friends and we started dating. It would take at least an hour with the traffic to go see her. So that was uh, getting pretty old. We discussed him maybe renting something up this way towards me so he wouldn't have to have that long drive at night after he would leave you know my house i was still living at home we found a home that was for rent in mount Tabor. actually it was a roommate wanted type of, of ad and my roommates were only there during the week 
so it worked out perfectly for us because he was very close. He didn't have to sleep on my parents' couch. Frank settled into his new home and was excited about his relationship with Marcia. Four to five weeks after I moved there, I was in the living room and the, um, the curtains started to flutter. The house was an old house, but we had put the plastic on the windows. We kind of hit with a hairdryer to seal them tight. There was no reason why the curtains were flooded because the windows were sealed. And then the temperature really dropped a lot, and I could see my breath, and it's almost like I was walking into a cold spot. And that wasn't the only strange occurrence. I would be in my room, and I would hear the radio go on downstairs. And you can hear the cha channels changing. It was an old dial stereo, and you can hear the channels changing, you know. It would stop on a big band type channel, like 40s music. And I'm like, well, who's playing 40s music? So I'm, I'm looking around. I'm on the second floor. I check my roommate's rooms. They're not there. So I, go, I start to go downstairs, and as soon as I get close to downstairs, the music stops. It turns off. I went back upstairs and I just um, started thinking that something is going on here. A few minutes later, I'd hear the radio go back on again. Opening the phone. And I'd go back downstairs again, and as I went downstairs, it would go off. I was in my room um, watching TV. Uh, there would be some um, knocks and uh, some bangs, sometimes some scratches. And then I would hear almost like voices, like talking, uh, mumbling. Um, and I kind of like, I was looking at my, listening to my TV and I heard it off behind me, like in the hallway. So I turned off my TV and it would be a faint mumbling. So I thought maybe somebody was home. So I went out and to the hallway and there was no one there. It, it stopped. Frank no longer ignored the strange events, but he was curious about his housemates and whether they had similar experiences. I didn't see my roommates a lot. We would like be two ships passing and I so we didn't have a lot of communication, um, and uh, I never really said anything to them when, we, when I did see them. Hey, how you doing, man? How's it going? How's everything? Things good. Working there was a moment where uh, my roommate Greg was in the kitchen, so we're kind of talking, hey, you know, how was your week, that type thing, you know. Yo, did you see that? <laughs> no, man, what did you see? All of a sudden, I see him look with his the glance up with his eyes past my shoulder like he saw something. And I said to him, I said, what's the matter? He says, well, I saw a shadow go up the stairs. I said, thank God it wasn't just me. It always helps to have other people validate what you see or what you think you see. Um, you know, it, it helps you because as an investigator, you kind of lose that sense of investigating when something happens because you want to believe that the supernatural exists or you want to believe that that particular home or where you are is haunted. With confirmation that the others were seeing the same thing, Frank finally confided in Marcia. I really, I didn't believe any of it because I was a big skeptic and I I really didn't, I just really didn't believe him. So I just kind of let it, just let it go. I said, you must be crazy and just we'll let it go. The next morning, Marsha was no longer a skeptic. So we were laying there watching TV and um... all of a sudden we heard water running. Did you hear that? Yeah. I walked down the hall, opened the bathroom door. <laughs> 
Frank Regillo had experienced many strange events in his home, but his girlfriend Marcia was skeptical until now. I really, I didn't believe any of it. All of a sudden, we heard water running. Yeah. I walked down the hall, opened the bathroom door, shower was on, and uh, all the water was running. So I turned everything off, left the door open, walked back down the hallway. Six or seven minutes later, all of a sudden you hear, Shh, and she goes, no way. It was on again. I said, this is unbelievable. I said, this is, it can't be true. It just can't be true. She beelined out of that house as fast as she could. Because I was just, at that point, I said, I'm not staying here anymore. Frank was quickly losing patience with the old house. Uh, all of a sudden, you hear this big crackle of thunder, and I had lights go out. I'm saying to myself, well, is it just my house or whatever? Or it might just be the neighborhood. I wasn't sure, so I went downstairs, went down to the root cell, because in the root cell is where the breaker, circuit breakers were. Found the breaker uh, breaker box. As I'm doing this, it was it got very cold. I, I feel something behind me. This red, these red, two red lights. Eyes. I don't know what you want to say they were. I headed right for those storm cellar doors that opened up into the backyard. I, I pulled the lever over, flipped them open. And I got in my car and I took off. That was the most terrifying to me. I just could not stay there any longer. I mean, I was willing to do anything just to get out of there. I said, I'll pay out the lease. I have no problem with that, but I'm moving. I didn't care. I was just glad to be out of there. We went in there, moved everything out in a matter of an hour, and I was gone. I was so glad to be out of that house. It, it was, it, it was... It's beyond words. It was really, it, it was just, it was just beyond words. Being chased out of your home by an entity is a chilling experience. Some people have no choice but to stay put, even when their entire household is being terrorized. Story 25, Cheryl, take one. My name is Cheryl Arnott. I'm from Lakewood, Pennsylvania. Ken's my husband. We met several years ago online, and then we just decided that we were going to get together and get a place. The house that we found was, it's like, a, it's a ranch style. I fell in love with it right away because the kitchen size is what I was, I wanted. Moving into the house were um, myself, Ken, my son, and my daughter. It meant a lot to me to have my family close. And I felt safe because of the area that we were in. It was home. It was. It was going to be a place to share our memories, going to be a place to share our, our lives. 
Cheryl and her family had everything they wanted, but it was early days in the house. The first time that I really noticed anything off is I gathered up the laundry. As always, I did it once a week, but I was separating the laundry and then all of a sudden I just get this feeling like I'm not by myself. It's like I'm, I'm not alone. And um, I, so what I did was I just kind of scooted the basket out of the way and I looked around the corner um, down the hall. I'm thinking some, somebody's there, but I don't see anybody. You might catch a glimpse of something out the corner of your eye, movement, and of course the movement makes you turn your head to look, but when you turn your head to look, there's nothing there, but you know your eye caught something because something over here moved. I'm thinking, this is crazy. I'm thinking, okay, you're tired, something. There has to be an explanation. Spirits will typically show themselves in various ways. Um, it could be through a cold spot. It could be through catching something at the corner of your eye, if you, if you can see it that quick. And a lot of times, uh, we like to call it, or I like to term it as a phantom draft. Um, all of a sudden, you feel a breeze, whether it just blows by you, or, or maybe something moves, or a curtain, or an object, um, just to let you know that they're there. They will use that. So it's typically just another form of communication and a manifestation of energy. But Cheryl's search for answers would only bring more questions. I went into the bedroom and then I felt something brush against my leg. And so I'm thinking it was my cat. So I want to push the cat away. And when I look down, there's nothing there. So it wasn't my cat. And it just, it was just rubbing against my leg like it was insistent on getting my attention. You just don't, you know, you, you can't, words can't even describe the feeling that goes through you because you're thinking this is just, this is totally unreal. Why is this, this shouldn't even be happening. It was a scary feeling because it's a, it's a contact. It's like a physical contact. Something touched you and you can't see what touched you. It's just mind boggling. I didn't tell anybody about it for a while. I, first person I did tell was Ken. He just didn't believe what he didn't experience or didn't see. Cheryl tried to ignore the strange events and move on with her life. Um, Bonnie moved in with us two or three years later after we bought the house. Bonnie is like a mother to me. My kids even call her Grandma Bonnie. She's been a, a, a great grandmother figure and a great mother figure. And I, I kind of lean on her heavy at times. It was just like a, one big family. And I enjoyed their company. They enjoyed my company. It just felt like we was helping each other out. They ended up making my bedroom down in the basement. As the family settled into their new living arrangements, the strange phenomena started up again. We were in the kitchen one day playing Scrabble. It's daylight, you know, and nobody's thinking about anything except for the game. Okay, Bonnie says, oh, I'm thirsty. So she gets up and she goes over to the cabinet. She takes out one of the cans. Pretty soon I look up and this thing moves. had tried to ignore the strange events in her home. But then her husband, Ken, and family friend, Bonnie, witnessed something they could not explain. Pretty soon, I look up, and this thing moves. The can was turning around on its own. 
on their poke and can. I was very scared. I couldn't even talk. I was so stunned. I was like, and I'm pointing and poking and pointing at this thing, saying, yeah, that's all I could get out. And then about that time, the pop in goes, Shh. I'm scared to death because I'm thinking any minute this pop can is going to fly and I'm not going to get hit by it. I'm in running position right now. When all three of us saw it, we just definitely knew there was something in that house and something wanted our attention. But who, what, why, where, all of that, I have no clue. The, the fear that everybody had was just what was going to happen next. The family was now on edge. Uh, the activity in the house after that Scrabble game happened was like, if you were walking from like the uh, kitchen into the living room, you might see something coming. And I, and, you know, you think Ken because the the shadow, whatever it was, was about as tall as Ken, which is he's like six two, and you'd see it. Like coming towards you, you turn to look thinking Ken. And when you turn to look, it was nothing there. It was always black shadows. They searched for ways to stop the unwanted presence. I was second guessing the house. Um, really, a move wasn't really, it was not really a big option because we had everything we had tied up into the house. It wasn't like you can just say, okay, I'm done with you, house, goodbye. You can't just put everything in your purse and go out the door with the keys. We had nowhere to go. Bonnie would soon regret her decision to move into the house. I was sitting at the table. I was all alone. Everybody else was in bed. And I kept hearing this uh, noise behind me. And I thought it was one of the kids trying to sneak up on me. And I noticed shadows. So I got paying more attention to that. Uh, precious moments that I collected. Glass ball had fallen on the floor and shattered all over the place, except for the little angel on the inside. And that stayed intact except the head. The head was like chopped off. Uh, I knew at that point something was there, but. Um, I didn't. Th I never at any time thought it was friendly. If it's friendly, it's not going to give you a feeling of fear and terror and wanting to get out of there. Something friendly won't do that. My son uh, went to his room one night, and he had just got into bed. His girlfriend at the time, her name was Nicole. He hears a woman outside of his bedroom door telling him, kill Nicole. Kill, kill, kill Nicole. Like she would do that for about five minutes, he said. Kill to daylights at him like when anybody is like how does this person or this thing that's outside of my door how do they know how do they know her name how do they know anything what, what, what else do they know about me what else are they going to say as morning arrived Cheryl thought she was safe I went over and I got in the shower 
And I thought, okay, I'm give my shower and get out of here. I've got stuff to do. And I was planning the day in my mind. And I'm standing there, soaping my hair. And um, I felt a hand. After witnessing an evil entity in their home, Cheryl Arnott and her family were living in constant fear. I went over and I got in the shower. And I'm soaping my hair. And um, I felt a hand. Well, I jumped about a mile. You scared the crap out of me. And uh, nobody was there. It was definitely trying to get my attention and trying to scare me because, what, well, you know, something friendly isn't going to come up behind you and do that. So I went over to the other one and I haven't been in that bathroom to shower or anything since. A few weeks later, the events took a different turn. We were in bed watching TV. But you could just see this thing slowly. It was like mist cloud. Just moving like slow motion. Ken says, oh my God, did you see that? I was like, what do you, your mind's just totally mush because you're thinking, this doesn't, this isn't normal. This doesn't happen. This is totally crazy. Nobody was sleeping. Nobody woke up out of a sleep. This is just the last straw when it starts to do stuff like that. I've had enough. I went over to into the kitchen. I was talking to Ken about something. I don't even remember what it was about. And we're both standing there and we're talking. Oh. And something shoved me. I went into the door and down, and I fell. I just went flat out on the floor. Ken's there helping me up. It's like, oh my God. I was standing there. It wasn't like, you know, I'm standing on floorboards that move, or I'm standing on ice, or something like that. That's explainable. I was, it, it was, it was, I was pushed. I was pushed. I was shoved. It, was, it wasn't a friendly thing. I mean, a, a person off the street, a person wouldn't put up with having come and... I mean, you're going to call the cops if somebody comes up to you and shoves you. As each evening arrived, the family worried about what might happen. I was laying in bed one night, and um, I just... It's just like somebody was there. It's almost like somebody comes up behind you. I didn't feel safe in the house at, at, at this point. This woman was like maybe this tall, standing. And it wasn't a child, it was a full grown woman. And her hair was like pulled forward. And it was just unevenly, like, like it never, like it needed trim really bad. And she just stood there with like a dead stare. She made sure I got a good look at her first. Then it was like sparklies, but it was black. And then it, they started to like the little glittery things started to just slowly fade out. You just felt like you were like a deer in the woods, and a hunter was just. You're just waiting for any moment for something to happen. So yeah, you felt you felt like this vulnerable, vulnerable target in your own home. They could no longer live like this and reached out for help. 
So it was due to a friend through Facebook that we actually did get in, in touch with the right kind of people. The plan basically was to go up there, validate their stories, what they were saying was happening was actually happening, and then to disperse what was there through several means. Because they were very religious, we decided to use their faith and back them up to try and get this out of their home. He that seek the Lord, look unto the wrong room. And I heard someone laughing upstairs. I knew there was no one up there and I didn't see anyone, but I could feel like there was someone there. The laugh itself didn't sound like a happy, funny, that was a great joke kind of laugh. It was more of a sinister, I'm going to get you kind of laugh. Lori wasn't the only one who was sent. Very creepy. Up until now, Lori had just been a visitor at her grandparents' house. But that was all about to change. My parents divorced and we moved to my grandparents' house. I was already not happy because my parents divorced, but the thought of having to live in that house was like my worst nightmare coming true. So I felt like I was being sentenced to like some kind of long prison sentence. When we moved there, I noticed that no matter what time of year it was, there were certain areas in the house that were always freezing cold. Sensitive to the atmosphere in the house, her cousins noticed it too. When it was not nice outside, we would be sent into the basement to play. The heater was in the far back corner and as long as I can remember, we would joke with each other that that's where the ghost was buried. Because next to the heater, there was a depression in the floor. Um, it was a very old kind of linoleum floor over dirt. And that part of the floor kind of sunk down lower as the house settled. And it was the size and shape of a grave. It was like dead stop, just like someone put their feet down on the floor. And then I would look back at the chair and it would be rocking. The air in the room just got that feeling like something was about to happen. that chair. That chair just gave me absolute creeps. And if I got up to go tell my grandmother, it would stop. My grandmother was a very religious person, one of them being my bedroom. It didn't make sense because my room got all the morning sun. It was on that side of the house. So it should have been bright, cheerful, and really warm, but it wasn't. Lori tried to ignore the strange experiences, but they continued. There was this old rocking chair. I would hear a noise. And I'd look over and the chair would be moving back and forth and back and forth. And then it stopped. 